So thank you all for coming this morning. I have come from California to talk to you about biochar. Uh, my colleagues from the USDA uh, have been keenly interested in what we're doing. And my, my role this morning is to really talk about what it is, why it's important, how do you make it, what are the economics around biochar, what are the markets, I really want to set a, a large context. And then my colleague, John Gaunt, who was going to talk this morning, but he couldn't make it. He's based out of Cornell. He's going to talk, which I'm going to give his talk for, but I'm going to talk about specifically land restoration and why biochar is relevant in that context. So I have about 40 slides here. I'm going to run through them relatively fast. Um, but I think what it will do is it will paint a pretty broad bash um, picture of, of why this is an important technology. So it goes without saying, biochar is getting a lot of attention. This is from the cover just last month from the BBC's Focus magazine, 10 Ideas That Will Change the World. And of course, biochar is one of them. You frequently see biochar as part of a list of big ideas that, that a variety of folks want to implement. So really, what is it? You know, you know, there's a variety of formalized definitions in the academic space. Um, the first one, obviously, is just char. Um, char is, is any carbonaceous residue that you would expect to see from natural fires. Charcoal, of course, you know what that is. It's a, it's a cooking fuel made from a variety of materials, whether it's animal or vegetable. And biochar is, is carbonaceous material that's produced specifically for ag or environmental management applications. In essence, we are biomimicrying fire. We are taking this, this idea that fire is a valuable tool to create a product called charcoal, but we're doing it commercially. And it's controlled, the surface area, the porosity, the cation exchange capacity of these materials is very specifically controlled. This is a slide that you oftentimes, rather a picture that you oftentimes see. Biochar was discovered in the Amazonia in the late 1800s by a Dutch agronomist. And what he discovered was there were these patches of very fertile land, you know, 20, 30 square hectares, that he named the terra preta or dark earth soils. This was in, in contrast to what you would expect to see in Amazonian soils, which have a very thin topsoil layer because most of the carbon is in the canopy, except for these dark earth soils. And it really wasn't until the 1960s that another Dutch agronomist rediscovered this. And, and really, it's only in the last 10 years has we, have we analyzed these soils in any degree of specificity and understood that it's the charcoal that it's in these soils that are creating these super soils. And what happened was these indigenous uh, populations were, were in the process of cooking using wood, were creating charcoal not optimized for ag, but creating charcoal, it would get mixed into these soils, and over time it would create these super soils. And so this is a relatively common picture you see in this space. This is what it looks like. It's very heterogeneous. Um, I was just talking to a colleague from the University of Nevada, and, and he was talking about the need to have a standardized format in terms of pellets, and I think that does make sense in some applications. But in general, when you make it, this is what it, it, it comes out looking like. It's, it's uh, created using thermal chemical conversions, um, where you, and this of course is the uh, oxygen to carbon molar ratio, and you can see there's different forms of this, biomar the, this, this uh, charcoal material. You start off with biomass, and then as you go down the scale, you start with char, charcoal, soot, and graphite. And this is really a, a close-up of what these various molecules might look like. I have a close-up here which shows really what you start with. So this is, if you think of pencils, we've got crystal and graphite here. And then if we go down here to here to here, as you add more heat, these layers become to disassociate. And you finally end up with these fullerene-type structures. They're three-dimensional. They're highly irregular. And we think that it's really this property of biochar that both provides the habitat for microorganisms, which is so desirable, but also provides the ability to retain water and nutrients because of the porosity and cation exchange effect. Um, this is a pretty common theme you'll hear these days in the biochar world. There's probably close to 300 startups around the world trying to commercialize these products in both the developing and developed world setting. Um, but what's clear is that all biochars are not the same. It's not a uniform, finely grade material. The, the structure of the feedstock itself will do a, to a large extent. It will be preserved in the pyrolysis process, which means the biochar itself will be highly influenced in terms of what you start with. And these structures can be engineered, not only during the process itself with various types of heating regimes, 
but post-process using, using um, processes called annealing or activation. So now that we know what it is, the real question is why is this so important? Why do people care about this? And the fact of the matter is biochar is at the epicenter of these meta issues around food security, water security, energy, climate, and waste management. They all are meta trends and problems that the planet cares about right now. And biochar fits nicely into all of them. And I'll tell you why right now. Um, goes without saying that there's this global imperative to increase ag yields, to lower the footprint of water use in ag, to revitalize degraded lands, to capture carbon, where carbon constraint in our atmosphere, and to decarbonize power production. These, all these themes are brought up in the process of biochar. Um, of course, agriculture is the driving force right now around commercializing biochar products. And the reason it is, is because it has these different attributes. It has the ability to retain nutrients using something called cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of the material itself to retain nutrients. And this is this very general values. Um, again, this is a very new space. And, and I've even seen a number as high as 30 or 40 percent in terms of reduced fertilizer costs. It really depends on the starting points of soils. It retains water because it's so porous. It essentially acts as a store for water resources. And um, again, the range that you typically see in the literature right now is between 5 and 20 percent. Just to give you a frame of reference, ag uses 75 percent of the world's water. If you can reduce that by just 10 percent, you would provide all the water resources for every other sector, town, city on the planet. So if, if you can reduce that by 10 percent, this would be a huge win. Um, of course, it provides habitat. And I talked about that earlier. This really may be one of the big advantages in terms of productivity is it catalyzes very healthy microbial communities. And then there's the, the basic physical soil structure of soils themselves. And biochar has the ability to improve drainage, aeration, and compaction, which leads to increased yields. And finally, if you make biochar the right way, it comes out as an alkaline material, which then can be substituted in for lime, which is very interesting in places like Brazil and the Sahara, which has very acidic soils or in China, which has been over-fertilizing for the last 10 years. And there, there, there's a crisis route in terms of soils in China for, in terms of being acidified. Um, I just want to show you just a few view graphs here. This is just a snapshot of some of the data points around yield, uh, water retention, et cetera. So this shows you the baseline here is 24 experiments for different crops without biochar. And then this shows you a variety of data points around what you might expect to see in terms of of increased biomass production. And the numbers typically range from 100, 125, 150 percent if the soils are in good shape. If the soils start off being very bad, then you see wildly increased yields, 3, 400 percent in terms of crop production. This shows you, I referred to cation exchange capacity, which is the ability of biochar to retain nutrients. This gives you, and the anthrosols are, is, is a, it's a code name in science for these terra preta engineered soils. And this shows you the difference in terms of this is the, this is the control, and this is the terra preta soils. And you can see there's a dramatic difference in terms of these soils to retain nutrients. Um, if you're thinking about um, um, uh, the application of fertilizers, you can see a pretty dramatic increase in the ability to retain phosphate. This is just one of the big three we think about of NPK. This is, and you, the controls, of course, are soils with manure or soils with high manure. Um, I mentioned the benefit around microbial species. On the right is a, a preserved forest sample showing various types of microbial activity. And on the left shows you the terra preta soils. And you can see there's a, a, a dramatic increase. And of course, this is from the Amazonian soil. So this, is, this isn't comparing temperate soils to tropical soils. This is, these, are, these are soils adjacent to the terra preta soils. And there's a, relatively dramatic increase in the diversity of the microbial species that are shown. Um, this is a, a couple of view graphs showing uh, the potential benefits of soil water. This is, of all the areas of biochar research, this is the, the area that needs the most effort and work on. We do know that biochar does retain water, but right now I can think of a number of experiments around the planet that are using lysimeters to measure the flow of water, but this does show you this is a control plot and this is the biochar plot. And you begin to get an idea that there is a retention benefit of biochar. The real question now is how do we optimize that? How do we optimize the designs of biochar 
to, to retain water effectively and provide it to plants. Um, one of the big benefits that typically people don't talk about is soils are a big source of greenhouse gases, in particular nitrous oxide. This shows you the effect of applying biochar to soils and the reduction of N2O emissions. And you don't typically see the effect for about 10 days, but there's a dramatic drop in off-gassing of N2O in soils. And granted, this is just one data point, but it does show you the potential benefits here. Um, so how do you apply it? Well, there's a variety of ways. Um, again, talking with my colleague from the University of Nevada, it's true that you, it's some, in some situations, if you put just raw biochar down, it creates all this clouded effect. Here, um, that's in fact what they're doing, and they didn't experience that effect here, but you can use a broadcast applicator or you can use um, injection slurry as you're injecting it with, with the seeds themselves. This is a picture from our colleague from Cornell. So I want to jump quickly to climate change because biochar is often addressed in any climate change uh, thesis around how do we mitigate climate change. And really it has three basic effects. It mitigates new emissions by uh, either reducing soil emissions, reducing CO2 emissions from feedstocks, or reduced fertilizer production. It has an adaptation effect, which is it allows soils to be drought resistant. It allows you to really control the effect of weather on, on agriculture. What we've been talking about is drawdown, where you sequester atmospheric carbon. But the fact is, this is a planetary solution. There is agriculture everywhere. And if you're in the climate world, you always, if you look for big winds, you look for gigaton solutions, solutions that can store a billion tons of carbon. I don't know if you guys know the mathematics, but right now we emit about 20, 25, 30 gigatons per year, projected to go to 60. So we're looking for a big solution to mitigate and to draw down billions and billions of tons of carbons. And biochar is one of this, but at the same time, it's a local solution. You know, local, global, local, global. We typically think about this. So here's the story around drawdown. So on an annual basis, the tree absorbs CO2. Right here on the left, it's the trees absorb CO2. The litter falls to the ground. The, the carbon is re-emitted. Half the carbon is used for respiration, and the other half is used to um, create biomass, and then that's re-returned to the, to the atmosphere. In the case of biochar, what you do is you take the litter that's on the ground, you pyrolysize it, and you capture that. So you take a carbon resource that cycles every year, and you create a metastable solid, which if you make it the right way, it can have, life, have a half-life of up to 500 or 1,000 years. Of course, depending on where you put it and what soils it is. This is a really big story here. So this drawdown category, you're going to see this increasingly in the, the climate change literature as, as we need to think about how do we capture existing atmospheric resources. And the reason being is that CO2 has such a long decay curve. 33% you know, of the CO2 that's in the air is, is still there after 100 years. 19% is there after 1,000 years. So there's a very long tail here. So if we are carbon constrained, if you buy into the thesis that there is a problem with climate, we need to think very aggressively about how do we draw down carbon, and at the same time, how do we draw down carbon and create a valuable product? It doesn't really make sense to me to draw down carbon and put it into old oil wells, because it eventually leaks. But if you can draw down this carbon and create a value-add product, either in terms of biochar or use that CO2 to create algae masses, and then, then you really start to talk about something because you can leverage the capital markets to deploy these solutions. So this is just a view graph that shows that you know, over time, uncharred biomass eventually decomposes and the carbons are released into the atmosphere. Biochar, on the other hand, if you make it the right way, stabilizes this carbon. And again, um, the production process will determine to a large extent whether this biochar will last for 100 years, 500 years, or 1,000 years. Um, back to the carbon planning. This is a view graph from a climate foundation in San Francisco. What this shows you is that, you know, we, I told you we need to mitigate 30 gigatons of carbon in the next 25 years. We need to find a way to store it or, or eliminate it. We know what known mitigation is across these seven sectors. Each of these boxes represents a sector, power, industry, buildings, transportation, et cetera. And the number in the boxes represents how many gigatons we think we can actually mitigate across these different sectors. And the, the traditional analysis suggests that power is really the way to go, power and industry and transportation. 
But if you layer over biochar on ag, you begin to see that all of a sudden agriculture becomes a very big solution in terms of mitigating the risk around climate. This is another way to look at it in terms of the cost per ton. This is some work by my colleagues from McKenzie that they did for a utility in, in Scandinavia called Vattenfall. And what they did is they categorized the various mitigation, excuse me, mitigation potentials on the x-axis and the cost for each of those, those mitigation solutions. As you can see, many of these solutions around fuel efficient vehicles, lighting systems, insulation improvements actually have a negative cost. They, they immediately pay back. Whereas some of the longer term solutions have a much higher cost. The, 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 the mark we typically use is 50 tons, $50 per ton. This is in euros, so this is really about $70 per ton. And you can see the biochar fits nicely in here because it's not only does it able to capture billions of tons of carbon, but it's in a really nice price point. Um, of course, the question is, does it really last in soils for 500 or 1,000 years? These are some select, select data points from around the world. And you can see that at least under these situations, you see half-life ranging from 100 to several thousands of years. Um, if you really are going to put biochar in soils, you'd have to defend the fact that it's going to be there for some time. And that still is relatively controversial. I think it's true that there are some situations, particularly in forest environments, where the biochar may not last as long as other environments, especially if it's made from materials that, are, that um, have a high ability to be uh, metabolized by, by uh, soil organisms. Where are the opportunities for soil restoration? This, this just shows you some of the big, I mean, if, if, again, if you think of big markets for biochar, you think of the BRIC nations, Brazil, China, India, um, and the US. Of course, you can see that they're really big opportunity if you look at the blue and green across these countries. India, China, Brazil, these are huge markets. And there's a huge opportunity to leverage this in terms of both climate and increasing the efficiency of in terms of how we grow ag. If you think about water, you know, water, as I said, biochar retains water very effectively. And if you look at the map up here in the upper right hand corner, purple is economic scarcity, orange is physical scarcity of water. There's a lot of places on the planet that are going to be severely affected by climate change in the future, let alone what they find themselves today in. And so if we can find a way to retain water more effectively in soil system, that's going to be a big win for the planet. It's going to be a big win for farmers. And waste management. I know this is a, this is a conference looking at forest resources. And uh, that's very exciting because just talking to someone uh, before the break here, they said they have hundreds of millions of tons of wood resources that they could use to make biochar from. But you also think of things like litter, animal manures, um, chicken litter, hog manure, not so much cow manure, but some places in the United States, around the Delaware, around the Chesapeake Bay, there's a big runoff effect from chicken litter and hog manure. And that's an ideal source of material to make biochar from because it has a lot of nutrients in it. So you could actually make a biochar fertilizer. So how do you make it? Um, essentially, you take, you, you start with three basic technologies. In terms, if you think about biomass thermal conversion, you think about combustion where you burn it, Think about gasification, where you create a gas, which can then be used to create electricity from turbines or gensets. Or you think about pyrolysis, where you don't burn the material, you bake it. You put whatever resource you're thinking about, whether it's forest residue, urban tree waste, chicken litter, you put it in a box and you heat it up in the absence of oxygen. And depending on how long you heat it, what the rate of heating is, you get a different type of biochar. So this is called pyrolysis. And it's a mature technology. It's what they use right now to create coke from coal in the steel industry. So if you think about new industries, you want to use a mature technology. It has to be slightly tweaked. But pyrolysis is a very old technology. Um, as Mark will talk about, Mark Coleman, my colleague from um, Idaho, there are different ways to create biochar. And typically, you think about fast pyrolysis, intermediate pyrolysis, and slow pyrolysis. And as you can see, with each of these processes, you get different yields in terms of char, liquid, and gases. Um, fast pyrolysis tends to be used to create liquid fuels, bio oils from biomass. That's very exciting for a lot of folks, because we do need to find a way to decouple national security from imported oil. On the other hand, if you're interested in, in biochar, you, you want to use slow pyrolysis, because you can see you get a much higher yield relative to fast pyrolysis. 
And this is something to keep in mind is you, there's a decision tree in terms of how you use these resources, in your case, forestry resources, in terms of the materials you want to you want to uh, you want to make. So this is a schema that shows how do you start. So you start with these these. Um, organic materials, whether it's manure, compost, organic waste, chicken litter, corn stover, you put it in the kiln, you heat it up, about half of the output is released as a syngas, and half of it's released as a, as a almost pure carbon material. Char typically is about 80, 90 percent carbon, and you start with a carbohydrate, which is of course carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, so you have to find some way to throw off that oxygen and hydrogen, and that's what this syngas is. And that can be used for a variety of different things, whether you're making transportation fuels, whether you're using it to create electricity from a genset, or whether there's other co-products you're interested in. But this is the big schema that you think about. So the question is, if you really are interested in a gigaton scale, what do you do? Where are the resources? And this is just an idea. It shows you just in a very high level what you might expect to see in terms of global resources. And as so you can see, some of these categories are quite small, ground shells. Others are much larger. Um, but the fact is, this is a relatively small estimate. There was a study that was released last year that suggests that we can probably sequester close to three gigatons of carbon and char without much effort in terms of readily available resources. Um, but of course, you, this is another uh, geographic showing supply. And of course, you can see that at least by our estimates, you expect to see you know, hundreds, several hundred million tons of forested resources in the US. But there are all these other sources of biomass. And this is what you would need if you're interested in 1,000 four ton per hour plants. It's a relatively small amount relative to what's available. And then, of course, price matters. Um, in any enterprise, you want to make sure you can get the input for a relatively economical price. And there's a pretty broad distribution in terms of what you would expect to buy forest resources for. And they vary dramatically. And these are real data points that we've been able to cull from the literature in terms of what people are buying. Um, but as I said, the primary market for, for biochar is agriculture. And it's being driven by the high volatility of fertilizer costs, water shortages, shortages nutrient runoff, and the longer term trends, which are soil degradation, climate policy, food security concerns. These are all very relevant for farmers because they think about this a lot in terms of will they be able to grow crops the next year. And it's being driven by a variety of drivers, whether it's ag suppliers, farmers, bankers, public organizations. We're spending a lot of time working with the lenders because they see biochar as a way to mitigate future risk around climate change for ag. If they can create drought resistant soils or soils that are able to retain the swings of weather, whether it's very dry or very wet, that's very helpful for them. And, and um, you always want to go for the money is in terms of growing big businesses. And, and our lesson from the field is ag bankers really care about these new innovative solutions, not only in terms about soil quality, but in terms of access to renewable energy. Um, this gives you an idea of some of the markets that are available in the biochar space um, for various types of products, whether it's degraded soils, organic crops, golf courses, high value crops. And the fact of the matter is, you know, there's, there are markets for millions and millions of tons of biochar. The price will vary pretty dramatically from $150 a ton for degraded soils, perhaps as high as $400 a ton if you're selling into high value markets. And the market itself is, is huge. When you, when my, I spent a lot of time in the venture world the last few years, and they all want to know if you can build a billion dollar business. The fact that the matter is, is biochar, by our calculations, is probably a $200 billion business globally, and it's just getting off the ground. This is essentially a map that shows where you would be interested in talking to farmers. And you know, we're based in California. This is where a lot of the high value crops are grown. Um, but of course, there are row crops as well which we care deeply about, and those are mostly in the Midwest. Um, if you're thinking about ag input expenses, you want to you formalize this in terms of where people are spending a lot of money. And of course, it's distributed evenly between high value crops and the, low, and the row crops. And in California, and of course, lots of other parts of the country, a lot of people care about organic crops. And uh, we've spent a lot of time, as our, as our colleagues in the biochar space, how do you make organic for how do you make organic biochar crops? And then I just have a couple, two more slides and I'm done. There are other co-markets that you can think about as you monetize 
biochar, as I mentioned, you can, you will create power. If you're in the process of manufacturing biochar, you're in the process of creating electricity because half the carbon is released as a syngas. And this is being driven right now by the renewable portfolio standards and other financial centers across the country. Waste, of course, is a big driver, not so much in the United States, but in the UK right now, you cannot put new materials in landfills. So they're, they're looking aggressively for other ways to, to deal with this. And finally, there's the big carbon issue. I was telling Mark Coleman, who's going to speak after me, that we don't take any, when we model our business out, we don't account for any carbon crediting in our business because there's so much regulatory risk. If you're in Brazil, for example, around sugarcane or in uh, Malaysia around palm oil, you could monetize those carbon credits. But here in the United States, you're out of luck unless you want to go to the voluntary market. And this gives you an idea of what the markets might look like. The fact is, certainly in the, in the renewable energy space, it's a multi-billion dollar market. And if we can ever decide what to do about carbon in the United States, we also see this opportunity for billion dollar markets. So that's all I got. I covered a lot of material fast. I apologize for running it through, but I, I wanted to give you guys a flavor of what biochar is, why it matters, and what the markets are.